Would you open your Bibles to Psalm 66? We continue singing our way through the Psalms. Our student ministry, our uh, youth ministry, uh, were at camp last week, and they were at uh, one of there's several Baptist camps that are out around the state, and one of those is in Palacios, Texas, and that's where our students were. And I got all nostalgic about that because 34 years ago this month, I spent a year one week at Palacios Baptist Encampment. Uh, it was, uh, it wasn't youth camp, it was RA camp, and I was working as a youth minister, summer youth minister while I was in seminary in Eagle Lake, Texas, and I uh, took uh, six older grade school boys with me to RA camp for a week. And uh, the camp's a lot different now than it was then, thanks to a couple of uh, hurricanes that hit right on top of Palacios and rearranged everything at the camp. But the uh, same location as 34 years ago. Uh, is one of my, ultimately, it, I look back on that week and I thank the Lord for it. All six of those boys made commitments to Christ that week, uh, RA camp. It was just a great week in all kinds of ways. And so anyway, for, for me, Palacios, because of that alone, uh, is a special place in my heart. Now, the thing about that summer in Eagle Lake, Texas, and one week of it in Palacios is, uh, that was the summer before I got married. Uh, almost 34 years, 34 years ago, I was, we were making a lot of wedding plans and getting ready to be married one to another, and uh, that's a lot of years ago now for uh, that young couple, Chad and Rhonda, who uh, said I do in December uh, of that year. And I think back over all the things that took place since then, and you just add up a lot of memories about things. Some things are difficult things. Some things joy-filled things. And the thing is, in any relationship, I don't, it's, if it's friends, if it's family, if it's a marriage, you, you go through a long time together, there's a lot of things that come to mind and a lot of things to remember, shared experiences. And there's much you say, I'm glad we left that part behind. And then there are other things you say, I'm so grateful for that experience, for that uh, time in our lives. They're the challenges of the present. Each stage of a relationship always comes with new challenges. It's not just squared away. And I know in the, just, just in the parenting part of things, you say, oh man, if I get these kids out of diapers, my life's going to be awesome. If I, can just, if I can just get to there. And then, oh my goodness, now I'm full-time uh, I'm an Uber driver, and we're not getting paid for it, though. I'm just running my kids everywhere. And then, oh, if I can just get them out of high school, if I can just get them out of college, and maybe someday I'll be able to retire, then, oh, my goodness, as a parent, I thought I was done now, but come to find out those young adult kids, they're, they're kind of baby boomerangs. They just come back to you. And, and then, a lot of you know, you have, you have kids my age, and you say, I'm still trying to, trying to do some parenting with my uh, kids. It's just a lot harder to do from this angle. So there are a lot of phases of life, phases in a relationship. There are always new mountains to climb to. Uh, some you anticipate with excitement, some frightening, and sometimes right now it's just hard. And the same things hold true in a relationship to God. So I've been at this for a while now. Because I've been, I've had a relationship to God longer than I've been married to Rhonda. And that relationship to God, I look back. And just so much that I, I can say, well, thank you, God, for that. And thank you, God, for what you're doing in my life right now. And things that I anticipate. But I tell you, I am grateful that in 1970, the Holy Spirit convicted me that I was lost a sinner separated from God by my sin and I needed a savior and in 1970 I said yes to Jesus and I put all my faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for me and was raised from the dead and I surrendered my life to him and I've made a lot of bad decisions but I will never regret that decision it's the best choice I ever made in my life that commitment to Christ just as I exchanged vows of commitment with Rhonda and I put a ring on her finger and she put a ring on my finger in relationship to Jesus Christ I knew a lot about him already 
But there came a day in 1970 when we made that relationship official with a commitment. Uh, and I committed my life to him. And I experienced a forgiveness of sin. I experienced uh, what a relationship to God and walking through life every day with him was like. And had that assurance of eternal life in heaven. If you, and it, do you have a story like that? Has there ever been a time in your life when you said yes to Jesus? And because it's on my mind, because of 34 years ago at Palacios Baptist Encampment with a group of boys who gave their lives to Christ, because, because telling people about Jesus is the core of who we are as a church, if you have never given your life to Christ, today's a good day to do it. And I want to lead you in the kind of commitment prayer that begins a relationship to Jesus. So let's bow our heads because I, I don't want this to pass by. Maybe you would pray, dear God, thank you that you love me. But I know, I know I'm a sinner. I've broken your law. And I am sorry. I ask you to forgive me. I want to turn away from my sin. I believe Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sin. He's the son of God. I believe he was raised from the dead. Come into my life, Jesus. Take away my sin. I surrender my life to you. I want to follow you with all my heart from this day forward. In the name of Jesus Christ, thank you. Amen. Now, I want to read the 66th Psalm to you. And this is a, this is a great psalm. And it was so good. It's going to take four of us to get it done. But here we go. Let the whole earth shout joyfully to God. Sing about the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. See, that's, that's more than just mumbling praise to God. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awe-inspiring are your works. Your enemies will cringe before you because of your great strength. The whole earth will worship you and sing praise to you. They will sing praise to your name. Verse 5, come and see the wonders of God. His acts for humanity are awe-inspiring. He turned the sea into dry land, and they crossed the river on foot. They, there they, we rejoiced in him. He rules forever by his might. He keeps his eye on the nations. The rebellious should not exalt themselves. Bless our God, you peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard he keeps us alive. He does not allow our feet to slip. For you, God, tested us. You refined us as silver is refined. You lured us into a trap and placed burdens on our backs. You let men ride over our heads, and we went through the fire and the water. But you brought us out to abundance. I'll enter your house with burnt offerings. I'll pay you my vows that my lips promised and my mouth spoke during my distress. I'll offer you fattened sheep as burnt offerings and the fragrant smoke of rams. I will sacrifice bulls with goats. Come and listen, all who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth and praise was on my tongue. If I had been aware of malice in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. However, God has listened. He paid attention to the sound of my prayer. Bless be God. He has not turned away my prayer or turned his faithful love from me. Well, praise the Lord for Psalm 66. Now, here's the first thing you want to talk about, and it's what happens early on in Psalm 66. You look back and you thank God. You look back and you thank God. Verses 5 and 6, the psalmist recalls the mighty acts of God in the past. And he called everyone, come and see the wonders of God. His acts for humanity are awe-inspiring. He turned the sea into dry land, and they crossed the river on foot. There we rejoiced in him. Israel is grateful for their heritage. Through the Psalms, through the prophets, over and over again, through the teaching of God's word, they look back. They look back. Now, often we're so caught up in right now, we're just thinking about today. Just, I'm just treading water, trying to keep my head above water for today. But they found great hope and strength and courage by looking back and celebrating the great things God has done. And they, they revisit that over and over and over again. The patriarchs, they celebrate the patriarchs who 
took God at his word and took steps of faith because of it. The prophets who courageously spoke the word of God when it was hard to their generation. The psalmist who sang songs of praise in dark days. One of the ongoing themes you find, God's people looking back to celebrate what God has done. Every Christ follower, and especially those of us who've uh, been following for a while, imperfectly, uh, but following, we can look back and we thank God for the events that brought us hope in this life and hope for eternity. You, you look back and if nothing else, you say, Jesus came to this earth. Jesus died on a cross for my sins, for our sins. Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus, we anticipate always, Jesus coming again. The affirmations from the pen of Paul, things like, that is in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against him. He's committed us the message of reconciliation. The great blessings of God, the things he's entrusted to us in his grace and by his wisdom and for his power and purpose. We thank God for a Christian heritage that's permitted us and because in this, in this land of ours, such great access to the word of God faithfully transmitted over generations and available everywhere all the time for us the people who founded churches I've been a part of uh, seven different churches in the course of my life and in all those churches somebody began it somebody carried it forward somebody paid for buildings somebody made it possible for me to to go to camp me to experience God in multiple kinds of ways missions and Grace and Sunday school classrooms and all those things. I think about my parents, my grandparents, models of the Christ life. Think about faithful pastors who influenced my life over years, faithful Sunday school teachers. And you think about friends that kept you close to the Lord, or maybe a friend that told you about the good news of Jesus Christ. You think about prayers answered in the past. You think about next steps empowered. You think about grace God gave you when you couldn't do it by yourself. And we say, thank you, God, for yesterday. Because that perspective gives me hope for tomorrow. Here's a perspective. As we look back, what we see clearly powerfully demonstrated in God's word and why we need to take time to look back is we know God is faithful. Roger. Just as Chad was saying that because we can look backwards and we can see God's faithfulness in our lives, sometimes we read it in Scripture Sometimes we experience that in our own lives, that we have those uh, mark posts in our life that we can look back at and see God's faithfulness. We know that God is faithful, and we know that He is trustworthy. And we know that we can trust what is written in His Word. So when we read Psalm 66, 4, which says, All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. We know that at some point in time, Jesus will be victorious forever and ever. This is a prophecy. It's a promise yet to materialize. We know it's coming one day. It's going to be a day when our sign is replaced with singing and music replaces our misery. What a glorious day that will be. And that gives us confidence in tomorrow so that we can look forward, and trust God. This gives us security. It gives us peace as we face each day and all that it holds, both good and bad. You know, there are other places in scriptures that echo Psalm 66, 4, like Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the same name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. We can be encouraged in times of trials because we know how the story ends. 
with Jesus being exalted. You know, there's that old saying, I may not know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. And we also know who holds us because we trust in God. And because we trust and we know how the story ends, we can be encouraged to share our faith with others. That should be our motivation in all that we do. We look around our homes and our neighborhoods, where we work, where we play, where our kids go to school, and we should have the same mindset as Jesus that's reflected in 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You know, the road that you're on today may seem rocky and it may seem steep. It's a reminder that we live in a broken world. It's a reminder that the world that we live in is a hurting world. We have hope that God's promises will be fulfilled and His purposes will be complete. We, we live with hope and we live with trust. Jesus wants everyone to know Him as Lord and Savior and he allows you and me the opportunity to share that good news with other people. At some point in time, all creation will worship Jesus. And those who have responded to the gospel with faith and repentance and trust will do so gladly and willingly. So because of what God's word says and because of the hope that we have, we look forward and we trust God. All right. It's a great video. Uh, we're just going to jump right back into uh, Psalm uh, 66 here. And I've been given the assignment of verses 8 and 9. So I'm just going to read them. And it says, Bless our God, or praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard or heard abroad. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. So let me just take this, these couple verses. They're very straightforward, and there's just kind of a flash to the obvious ob observations here. Uh, the first verse, uh, bless our God, or praise all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. As Chad has already demonstrated, one of the most overarching themes from the book of Genesis to the, to the last book in the Bible, Revelation, is God is incessantly commanding and reminding his creation to worship him. Which begs the question, why would an infinite being need my praise? Why? Um, I'm going to answer that question, and Chad's answered it, and in, 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 so has Roger. But I'm going to tell you a brief story. About 20 years ago, I was in seminary, and I decided to email my roommate from college, who is an atheist and an agnostic. I don't know, he might listen to this sermon, so he might. <laughs> but at any rate, um, so we got into an email exchange. And I kept these emails for years, and we went back and forth and back and forth. And he ended the email exchange, and he had been, re I've been saying, hey, read this passage and stuff, and just trying to see if I could somehow change his mind. And he ended the email exchange very abruptly. Um, I, I lost the emails, but I'm going to paraphrase what he said to me. He says this, I can't follow a God that is so self-centered that he or she, he didn't know which it was, is constantly demanding and needs my praise and worship every week. I don't want to follow such a needy being. Uh, my friend saw the praise that God demands of us as a weakness and that we're like some codependent relationship. At the time, I didn't know what to say to him. I was kind of flat-footed, and, and as I look back on it, there was nothing I could have said that would have changed his mind. But as I reflected on his words, and there's a gross misunderstanding from him, from an outsider's perspective, there's an element of truth in that. God is a very self-centered being, and he's consumed with himself. See, that's entirely inappropriate for any of us to be that way. Any other being on this planet that demands praise, 
It would be corrosive and destructive to their soul, but it's entirely appropriate for God to be self-centered and self-consumed. And the beauty of it is you are the greatest beneficiary of that exchange. Let me demonstrate, and Chad touched on this. I, I believe that praise is a domino that falls, and there's all kinds of blessings and uh, uh, praise things that happen in our life. Let me, and, and, and several of you have already seen this, so this is kind of how it happens in my mind. And Chad's touched on this really well. I think about who God is. I think he's omniscient, he's infinite, he's incredibly creative, he's loving, he's kind, he's compassionate, he's dealt with me all these years, he is just, he is graceful. Have you guys ever seen Blue Planet, how creative God is? I mean, he's just infinite. He's beyond any of us. He never learns, he never, he never asks a question. I just start thinking how incredible he is. And then you know what begins to happen in my heart? praise begins to erupt, or it should. I did this every morning. I just, I just go over the things, and I think about what he's done for me, and how he, you know, he's, he's put up with me, and I think, Chad, I love the statement. He always says, you, if you're sitting in this room, you, you have the birth lottery, okay? And I think about that, and I just, I, just, I just meditate on what he's done for me, and then praise begins to erupt, and I stole him. And then my affections are stirred, Right? My emotions are stirred, and I want to obey him. I want, I want to exercise faith in hard places. And then I experience God and his presence and the, and the blessing of obedience, and I grow spiritually, and then it starts all over again every day. Praise is the proverbial domino that falls, that leads the spiritual blessing and spiritual growth. It, it postures my heart long-term for obedience. It, it, it tenderizes my heart so I can hear God and praise him. And I need that every minute of the day. Um, praising God is, is the command is here. I, I think any time we talk about praise, um, the elephant in the room, at least it is with me, is how do you praise God when everything's going south? in your life. I mean, when you're getting excruciating news, there's painful stuff going on in your life, and, and things are not going well. It's easy to praise God when the wind's at your back, right? It's easy to, and I can give you the Sunday school answer, and I can show you several places in Psalms where David is praising God, and then he's complaining, and back, and I mean, it's just, but about six years ago, I, um, it's the best I can remember, I saw this in living, or heard this in living color. Uh, my, uh, my wife's grandmother passed away six years ago, and her name was Mamma. I love the names that they give grandmas in the South. I didn't even know what her name was until five years into marriage. I'm like, Jill, what's your grandmother's name? Is it really Mamma? Is that her name? No, it's Mary, actually. Um, but um, she, um, she was admitted to the hospital six years ago, and they uh, brought her into the hospital, and they started to realize that she had... Um, uh, had a circulation problem. She actually had gangrene in her legs. And the doctors came in. And, and her son, Jeff, is telling this story at the funeral. Um, and I actually called him yesterday to confirm all these details. And the doctor comes in. And he basically says, uh, Mary, um, you're, there's nothing we can do. Uh, you're you're going to die within a matter of days to weeks. We we can amputate your legs and give you a few more days, but we really don't know. And he and Jeff's telling this story. He says immediately his mom raises her hands and starts singing, "How great is my God! How good He is to me!" The funeral. I mean, it was arresting to me. At that moment, and the doctors are in awe. Like, what, what is this? She starts singing to God, how great you are to me. What I didn't tell you about Mamma is she raised four boys as a single mom in the 50s, six, turbulent 60s and early 70s at near poverty. She had no money. And I got to believe that that day when she got that news and she could praise her God, that was a lifetime of praising God over difficult circumstances, and that day just didn't happen by chance. 
she died about a week later. She got to praise her God in person with no pain. And then the psalmist says this statement, and Chad's touched on this, and so has Rogers. It says, all peoples will praise the Lord. If you read the next psalm in Psalm 67, eight times in seven verses, God says, all the nations and all the peoples will praise me. I got to be honest with you. Every time I see that in the word of God, I think, how unrealistic is that statement? How detached from history and reality is when I read that, all peoples. I mean, you don't have to travel too far to realize this isn't happening at all in the world. It's getting dark out there, and it's getting worse. But as Roger quoted Philippians chapter 2, there will be a day where every knee and every tongue will confess either in eternal punishment or in eternal glory who our Lord is. And besides all that, I know how the story ends. In Revelation 7, it says every, John is transported to the future and he sees every nation, every tribe, and every tongue worshiping our Lord before the throne. So if it doesn't happen on my watch, it's going to happen. And then he ends the psalm, verse 9, and I'll, I'll end here. He says, he has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. That's what a father does, isn't it? How many times as parents you've kept, you pulled your kid back? Or you, you know, you, you, you coddled them? Or, or, that's what a loving father does. I, I end with this. Um, in the NIV, what I want you to focus in on is the plural adjective that modifies the nouns in this verse. Our God our lives are, and our feet. Chad pointed this out last week. I thought this was a wonderful point. A lot of spiritual growth in the Bible is couched in plural terms. I don't like that. I want to grow by myself. A lot of the promises and protections in the Bible are given in plural nouns. In our independent, introverted, privatized Christianity, one of the hardest things to, to put our arms around is that for me to experience God and his protections and his promises, it has to ultimately be done in a committed, other committed relationships with Christians if you really want to experience what God has for you. That's hard. You know, as we're running around Allen for the last two and a half years knocking on doors, one of the overarching things I have seen, I see this every week we go out, is people who will affirm the gospel. Oh, I, yeah, I love Jesus. Oh, I know exactly. And then we all follow up the question, are you in a gathering with anybody? Oh, no, not at all. They have missed one of the primary things of Christianity is you have to walk with others and experience the promises and protections. And then I end here. I said that a few times. This is where I end. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. I don't have a chapter and verse for this, but I, I like to think in heaven when we get there, he's going to show us all the times he kept us from getting into a mess and how he preserved our lives that we have no idea was happening. And then we'll get to praise him for the, all, all those opportunities we're unaware of. Bless our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. Earlier, Chad was uh, talking about his marriage to Rhonda, and uh, it got me thinking. Uh, I, I've been to a bunch of weddings, tons of weddings. I've been a, a youth minister and being in ministry for as long as I have. Um, I, we get invited to a lot, and I also get um, asked to be in a lot of them, you know, to, to be the, the minister in the wedding. It's, it's always a privilege and, and, and such an honor to, to, to do that. And you know, when, when you can, how many of you have been to weddings? Ra raise your hand if you've ever been to a wedding. Yeah. Hopefully those of you who are married will raise your hand, because whether you believe it or not, you were at one, okay? It may not have been in a church, but you were at one, 
Okay, and you know that part of the wedding where the couple, they're, they're, they're looking at each other, and I've been a part of tons of weddings where, where some of the, the, the couples, they're just nervous, and they're just, I mean, their eyes are just this big, and they're just looking right at you, and they're going to do everything that you say, uh-huh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, and then I've been at those where they're just, I mean, they won't stop looking at each other, and it's like, I mean, hello, I need you to look at me just for a second, you know, but, but you get to that point in, in, in the service where they're looking at one another, and they're exchanging their vows, um, and, and you know what each one of them is expecting in that moment? When they're looking at whatever the vows, whatever, whatever they're repeating or whatever they've written together, um, you know what they're expecting from, from each other? They're expecting everything, all, all. The husband wants everything that she has. The wife wants everything that he has. And, and I'm not talking about money and I'm not talking about stuff, but I'm talking about love. I'm talking about the heart, the spouse once at all. No one goes into a marriage saying, you know, I hope I just get a little bit of you. You know, just I, I realize you're gonna, you're gonna, your affection, some of your affections are going to be over there with, with those people and, and over there. And, and I realize that I may not be the, the number one woman in your life or the number one man. You, you know, that's a, I just want to look. No one goes into a relationship that way. At least I, I hope you don't. No one goes in that. Nobody wants their spouse to have a divided heart. You don't get married so that you can share your spouse. In wedding language, it's basically saying forsaking all others. Forsaking all others. In other words, you as husband, I'm giving all of me to you. Or as wife, I'm giving all of me to you. And that's, that's how it should be. And in Psalm 66, 13 It says, I will enter your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows. And keep going on to verse 14, that my lips promised and my mouth spoke during my distress. In in the book of Leviticus, you learn about these these offerings that he's speaking here, that the Israelites made to the Lord. And, And in most of the offerings, a portion of the offering was placed on the altar of God and then a portion was, was usually given over to the priest. A lot of times priests, they didn't, they didn't make money. And so a part of how they were, how they were provided for was they were giving some of the, some of the offerings. And so in, in a lot of the offerings, a portion of the offering would go to the altar of God and a portion of the offering uh, would go to the priest. But the offering that the psalmist is talking about right here, this burnt offering, this was an offering or a sacrifice that was given totally and completely over to God on the altar. It didn't go anywhere else but to God. And as one writer put it, he said this was totally Godward. In other words, it was all consumed on the altar. It was meant to be a symbol of total dedication to God. All that I am, God, I give it gladly to you. And if you notice, if we, as we were reading Psalm 66, uh, the psalmist is telling everyone to worship the Lord and, and, and to follow God. And, and it's very much, he's calling all of us. But then in verse 13, he starts it with, I, I will. So he's calling all of you and he's calling all of us. But then he turns and says, I'm going to do this too. I am going to give God my all. James 4, 7 says this. It says, so give yourselves what? Say it. Completely to God completely to God. Give yourselves completely to God. It's, it's, it's meant to be th- this offering. It's that total dedication to God, but it's also meant to be this overwhelming. Uh, it's supposed to symbolize this overwhelming debt that we owe to God and how extremely thankful that we are for his love and presence in our lives. If God has gone to such great lengths to be in relationship with us, then why would we give our lives to anything or anyone else? Believe me, no one has come close or will ever come close to loving you and me as much as God loves us. God, God's love for us, it, it changes everything. We're called to give him everything because he gave us everything. In a world where life just doesn't make sense sometimes, in a world where our problems feel overwhelming, in a world where we sometimes we feel like we're fighting the battle all by ourselves, when fear, negativity, discouragement, doubt, and frustration seem like the overarching sentiments in our life, what we can do is we can look up and find God. We can look up and find God. Life doesn't always make sense. Um, but, but what does make sense is that God loves you and, and he loves me. He, he doesn't hold back. 
He overwhelms us with his love. Uh, he promises to walk with us through the dark valleys and through the, the bright mountaintops. And when we look up and see God, there's a peace that will sustain us through whatever, whatever we experience in this world. And it doesn't take long. You know this because you live in this world. It doesn't take long to reach the end of ourselves in this world. We need something. We need something more. And we will quick, quickly learn that the world doesn't have what we need. The world, the world doesn't have it. What we need is, is we need God. And when we look up, we see a big, big God. And then the stuff that we go through doesn't seem to be as big anymore. It's not that it's not big, because it is, but in perspective, compared to our God, what we go through isn't as big. He makes those things smaller. He gives strength to those who feel powerless. He gives joy to those who feel empty. He gives peace to those who feel out of control. He gives hope to those who feel hopeless. And did you notice something in, in all of those perspectives? And our, our worship team can go ahead and come on back up. But in all those perspectives, Chad said that you need to look back and you will see God. You'll see his faithfulness. Roger said that if you look forward, then you can trust God because he will fulfill all his promises. And Russ said but part of what his message was to look around because of the, the great faithfulness that, that he's given to us and, and all that he's done. Our worship, our worship points us to God, and when we point to God, we want to obey him and we want to follow him. So when we look around, we serve him. The world needs God, and we're called to share Christ with others through our acts of service and our testimony. And then just now we said, look up and you'll find God. And he'll give us exactly what we need. But you, you notice something about all four of those perspectives. None of them said, look to yourself. None of them said, look at yourself. It's not about us. We, we want to make it about us. The world will tell you it's about us, but it's not. Life is so much bigger than us. Life works best when we look to God. God will change your perspective on your world, on your family, on your job, on your friends, on your church, on your neighborhood, on your purpose, and it will change your perspective on you because you will begin to see you and you'll begin to see everything else through the eyes of God. The blessed life is a life that is surrendered completely to God. The sacrifice, the offering of ourselves is placed on the altar and it is meant to be consumed totally by God. And I think for a lot of us, and I'm going to say for all of us, it's time for us to change our perspective. Look back. Remember that God is faithful. Look forward. Remember that God's going to continue to be faithful. Look around. God wants to use you as a minister and look up because God is with you.